I'm excited to present to you something I've worked on in my mind probably for years, but just put together as a presentation recently. The poster tells you that the presentation is about Norman Turkey Stearns. Norman Turkey Stearns is one of my favorite players of all times because his name is Turkey Stearns. That's, that's where it started. I've been doing fantasy baseball online probably for 15 years, maybe longer, and so I have certain names that I'm known under in the fantasy baseball universe, but my favorite is Turkey Stearns. So I had a curiosity with him from a, from a younger age. The presentation is broader than that. It's about baseball, blacks in America, from the course really of reconstruction up through modern times. I grew up playing baseball, and I loved baseball. But much like growing up in this area in general, it was noticeable that I was one of few black people in a lot of venues that I traveled to. And the baseball diamond was definitely one of those places. <clears throat> Historically, blacks in baseball have had uh, a deep connection. And through the course of time, it's ebbed and flowed. And much of that has to do with how American history has ebbed and flowed in relation to black people acceptance, um, being able to get into to different areas and audiences for opportunities. So this is a pretty simplistic slideshow. But again, I'm, I'm calling this blacks baseball in America. So in 1865, at the end of the Civil War, there were four million slaves in the United States. And at that point, obviously, the 13th Amendment liberated black folks. New hopes, new opportunities abounded. And coincidentally, at the very same time, American baseball is formulating. The game is becoming popular. It's actually traveling abroad already. And you had a number of people during the Civil War and then immediately after very interested in this game of baseball. Freedom meant access to new marketplaces, access to the voting booth by 1870 for black men. Of course, women will have to wait a lot longer. And it meant the first black, ball, black baseball clubs forming for the first time. So here's a picture of the Cuban Giants. That's actually a later picture. But the first baseball game ever played between black clubs was the Brooklyn Uniques and the Philadelphia Excelsiors. That, that game took place in 1868, which was kind of symbolic because that very same year, the National Association of Baseball Players, which was the amateur organization that ran all baseball in the United States at the time, banned black people. So that was the official banning of blacks from amateur club baseball in 1868. Now, interestingly, two years later in 1870, that organization dissolved completely. And at the same time, professional baseball began in 1869. So we were allowed to play professional baseball as black people initially. The ban that will come along is actually known as, quote, unquote, the Gentleman's Agreement. And that will take place closer to 1900. During this era, the greatest ball player in black America was Bud Fowler. He was born John Jackson. And his father was a runaway who was a hop farmer and a carpenter. And they actually found their way, interestingly enough, to Cooperstown, New York, which is where he grew up. Fowler was renowned as a second baseman. I loved the turtleneck under the uniform early on. One of the cool things for me is looking at baseball fashions throughout the time and how uniforms have changed and evolved and all the different ideas around them. But Fowler's cool to me, too, because he's credited by many with creating shin guards. But he wasn't catching. He was playing second base, and all the white players, or many of them, would try to spike him coming into second. So he actually took wooden slabs that he attached to his shin so that he didn't take as much punishment when he was turning double plays and tagging people out. This is Plessy. Uh, I'm sorry, this is Homer Plessy. Plessy versus Ferguson was a Supreme Court case in 1897 that created separate but equal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at that time, apartheid America began, right? And we officially go into this Jim Crow status where we have separate societies that are uh, you know, very well documented, codified. It becomes almost an impossibility for blacks to continue to play professional baseball, as it was. You know, you had Bud Fowler, you had Moses Fleetwood Walker. You had some great players in that gilded era. But as you approach 1900, again, this is the time when blacks will be ostracized from professional baseball. So in order to keep playing, we had to figure out what we were going to do, because we certainly weren't going to stop playing. At this very same time, urbanization is occurring throughout America. So America is not a, a dynasty of cities in its initial 
reality, right? It's not until you get to 1900 that you start to see cities really fill out. That's the time we get YMCAs, YWCAs, urban leagues. This picture has nothing to do with baseball. It actually has to do with basketball, which if you know me is one of my other great loves. On the far right, right is Edwin Bancroft Henderson. He is credited with bringing basketball to black people. He took a course at Harvard in 1904 during the summer and then brought basketball back to Washington, D.C. And why this picture is also wicked cool, that's Charles Drew in the middle, the light-skinned brother next to the basketball, the doctor of plasma, if you will, who of course becomes famous for, for other things down the road. I just love that photograph. If we were going to keep playing, we had to figure out what to do. So many blacks left the country. We went to places like Cuba. In 1864, it's alleged that an American ship pulled in to a harbor in Cuba, uh, Montanzas Harbor. On board were American merchants that were loading on sugar. The relationship between the United States and Cuba that led to the Spanish-American War is a story of sugar, ultimately. It's alleged that these merchants taught Cubans how to play baseball in part because they wanted to sell them a bunch of baseball equipment that they had on board. That story is not exactly verified within many Cuban circles. Most folks in Cuba, um, this is a picture of Esteban Bellan. He's the first Cuban to play professional baseball in the United States. But there's another gentleman, his name is Nemicio Guyo, who I can't find photographs of, who's actually credited with starting baseball in Cuba by Cubans. What's interesting about this dude is, he attends a college in Alabama in 1862 in the midst of the Civil War where he learned to play baseball. And then he took baseball back to Cuba. We could play baseball in the Caribbean because racism didn't exist like it did in America. So many of our great players during this era will spend their summers playing in Cuba, eventually in Puerto Rico, uh, Mexico, and Venezuela as you move forward. The Latin leagues are welcoming to blacks, and thank goodness, because during that time, some of our greatest players were able to keep their skills sharpest by actually going abroad. Just a side note on the, the evolution and the spread of baseball. During the Ten Years' War in Cuba, essentially 1867 to, to 1878, insurrections against the Spanish occurred. Cubans loved baseball. It almost immediately became their national identity. The Spanish colonial authorities made Cubans go to bullfights on the weekends. It was a sign of sort of reverence to the crown for the longest time. Cubans didn't really want to go to bullfights, they wanted to play baseball. They started professional baseball leagues and started not going to bullfights and going to baseball games. They banned baseball in Cuba in 1869. And when the Ten Years' War was going on, a number of Cubans had to flee the country. And they went to Puerto Rico, they went to the Dominican Republic, and they took baseball with them to those places. So when you look at the major leagues today, and it's dominated by Latino players, especially Dominicans, that's where the, the roots of baseball are, are found in those countries. Here's a picture of Oscar Charleston in the middle. He's probably the greatest black player of that era. He is flanked by Pueblo Mesa and Alejandra, two of the great Cuban players of that generation. And when we talk about blackness and we talk about race, and I talked a little bit about this at other lectures, obviously the majority of Africans that came to the New World did not settle in America. They settled all over the place. So the number of black Cubans that played professional baseball is massive, right? So we sort of delineate between black Americans and black Cubans, black Dominicans, etc. But black baseball was a passion throughout the Caribbean by the time you get to 1900. This is a map that features the Great Migration as it's known. So between 1915 and 1970, roughly six million African Americans left the South. Prompted initially by World War I, obviously World War II brought new opportunities, but you had this diaspora of blackness out of the South, into the Northeast, into the Midwest, and into California. I mean, those of you who know the story of Jackie Robinson know that he'll find his way to California when his mom picks the family up and moves them out west. So this sort of spreading of black culture led to the seeding of jazz in places like Chicago, the seeding of baseball in places like Louisville, and this expansion of black baseball and culture during the time. So. This is a picture of Andrew Rube Foster. And in 1920 in Paseo, Kansas, at a YMCA, Andrew Rube Foster held a conclave of the black businessmen in the area. He had an idea to start his own league. 
his own baseball league. By 1920, clearly blacks weren't allowed to play professional baseball. And he was the owner of a team called the Chicago American Giants. He was a very astute businessman. Sadly, he had some problems with his health not, not long into this venture. But in 1923, um, the second uh, Eastern Colored League was formed. And Andrew Rue Foster formed the National Negro League three years earlier. So his league starts in 1920. Edward Bolden starts a league in 1923. And you have two functional black baseball leagues operating in the United States by 1923. For 10 years, they thrived. I mean, if you know anything about the 20s, we tend to think of it as the roaring 20s in the U.S. Uh, there's, there's a backstory there, certainly. But it's a healthy baseball environment in black America at the time. But by the time we reached 1930, these teams have folded due to economic challenges and a few other reasons. Back up there for a second. You probably recognize that man. In 1933, the Negro National League formed. And then in 1937, the Negro American League formed. And those two leagues became the most celebrated, popular, and historic African-American baseball leagues in history. All-star games between the two leagues featured 50,000 fans at their peak, which was an enormous amount of people. And baseball in black communities throughout the country became this focal point of economy, of culture, of gathering. Everyone would go to church on Sunday and leave their finest clothes on and head to the ballpark after. And Sunday was the featured day for baseball games within black stadiums uh, throughout the course of the Negro Leagues. During World War II, as more blacks moved north and the defense industry provided jobs across the country, times were a little better. There was more money to be had. And because of that, you see attendance go up. Uh, you see a flourishing of black baseball during that time. But I juxtaposition that with this reality. Many of you may or may not know that Jackie Robinson enlisted in the Army. He actually was friends with Joe Lewis, who you may know of, the great boxer, yes? And he appeals to Joe Lewis because they're not allowing any blacks to enter officer programs within the Army. Jackie Robinson, along with a handful of other blacks, will be allowed to become a second lieutenant in the Army. He's actually training with a group that becomes Patton's Panthers, the first black tank unit to ever enter combat during World War II. Jackie Robinson gets in a fight that is still not well documented. Most people say he refused to go to the back of the bus on base at Fort Hood. I've read stories that said he was sticking up for the wife of one of his colleagues, but he challenged the bus driver and a white officer on board, got in a fight, was court-martialed. In 1942, he was discharged from the Army before he ever saw service. So while back home, Negro Leagues are sort of proliferating and growing, the person's name who's most associated with integrating baseball is facing pretty hardcore racism within the United States military at the time. The Negro Leagues themselves were full of flair and drama. So this is a picture of an umpire punching somebody out at first base. <laughs> I, I found another picture that I couldn't find when I went to look for it again. It's a brother calling someone out at second while he's doing a full split. The umpire pops into a split and calls him out at the same time. There was this flair and drama to the Negro Leagues that was just different. The speed game comes from black baseball. So a ground ball in the infield that allows somebody to go from first to third, that's speed. That was Negro Leagues. Triples were celebrated in the Negro Leagues. Right? The idea of the speed game really comes from black baseball during this era. It's one of my favorite pictures that I found. And this gentleman is, is actually a great curiosity. He was the last surviving black umpire from the Negro Leagues. Uh, he only died in 2014. And his story, which I read some about in the last couple of weeks, was pretty fabulous, certainly. Rube Foster, who I showed you earlier, who sort of started organized black baseball, was institutionalized in 1926. This led to a lot of hardship within a lot of uh, black clubs. And, and black baseball struggled ultimately financially from a couple of main perspectives. Players would float from team to team to team, sometimes week to week, depending on who was willing to pay them more that week. Right? So to keep a player on a team for more than a couple weeks could be difficult at times. 
You also had instances where many of the better teams, like the Kansas City Monarchs, the Homestead Grays, if they could get an opportunity to barnstorm, which is the term you use to play against teams just arbitrarily that aren't in your league, so if they had an opportunity to play against another barnstorming team for more money, they wouldn't show up at their scheduled game that day. They would go play against the barnstorming team. It was real arbitrary like that because it was ultimately about money. You know, I really associate it with the black music scene in that era where you know, John Lee Hooker is one of my favorite artists. And we're just now discovering all these new recordings of John Lee Hooker that he made other names like Hooker Lee or Hook Johnson. Yes, because his name was owned contractually. And he would make all kinds of music under different names that we're just now figuring out as his music. It was a real sort of calamity to, to the Negro Leagues that was similar to that. Here's a crowd in Kansas City watching a Negro League game on a Sunday afternoon. You can see how packed the stands are. And this is another side of the Negro Leagues that's both disturbing and fascinating. I'm going to read you some of the teams in the Negro Leagues. The Birmingham Black Bears, the Mobile Tigers, the LA White Sox, the Oakland Lakers, the Wilmington Potomacs, the Atlanta Black Crackers. I'm sorry, that's just one of the funniest names I came across. <laughs> the Atlanta Black Crackers. The Chicago Columbia Giants. The New Orleans Black Pelicans. Yes, everything comes full circle, right? Um, the Pittsburgh Crawfords, whose picture is up here on the desk if you want to check it out. The New York Cubans, one of the most famous teams. The Homestead Grays, who you've probably heard of. And then you had this section of barnstorming and black baseball that featured this over-the-top, blackface-style racism that became very popular within many cities in the United States. This is a picture of a player from a team known as the Zulu Cannibals. They wore no shoes, played in grass skirts, had their faces painted in stereotypical continental paint, if you will, and the starting lineup read like this. Wahoo, Limpopo, Rufiji, Tana, Taklui, Bisagos, Congo, Kalahari, Tankafu. They didn't even use their actual names. They gave them these made up, uh, I guess, supposed to be sounding continental African names. These, these teams received a lot of attention. A lot of people went to their games. The other big one was the Indianapolis Clowns who painted their faces like clowns and played in a very theatrical, silly way. Uh, the Zulu cannibals would chase each other around the field with spears in between innings and do over-the-top, stereotypical, ridiculous behaviors that attracted a lot of attention and, sadly, gate receipts. People paid to go watch this. That's a picture of Sid Pollock. And I had to credit him because that was his brainchild. Sid Pollock created both of those teams and sort of was renowned throughout this era for his penchant for <laughs> sensationalism, frankly, exploiting black stereotypes and making money off of it. I had to show these dudes because it was such an interesting oddity for me. So this is a group that calls themselves the Sons of David. They're an Israelite community that formed in uh, Charter Township, Benton Charter Township, Michigan. They were an odd religious group that didn't cut their hair or their beard, and then they fell in love with baseball. And they became one of the primary barnstorming teams throughout this era. Their founder was a guy by the name of Benjamin Purnell, who was eventually arrested on 14 counts of statutory rape, kind of like John Humphrey Noyes. And I'd have to call it a cult, but they started to get a lot of attention and hire some of the best black ball players at the time. Satchel Paige played with these guys and actually wore a fake beard and fake long white hair when he was on the field with them. That is just unbelievable to me. They're also credited with creating another baseball um, tradition that is, is sort of sacred to me, uh, and that's Pepper. Anybody who plays baseball in here or has ever played baseball might know what Pepper is. It's a warm-up activity you use to work on your hand-eye coordination, your fielding skills, etc. And they would do these sort of pepper exhibitions before their games. They were just bizarre. I had to share them with you. In 1944, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who you're seeing here probably throwing a baseball at a black person, he was an incredible racist, is finally going to retire as commissioner of the major leagues. It's no coincidence that this is the era where Jackie will enter. Jackie comes straight back from being kicked out of the Army and has tryouts with the Chicago White Sox. He's talking with Branch Rickey by the time it's 1944. And it really takes 
the retirement of Kennesaw Mountain Landis, actually his death, to move the sport forward. Jackie Robinson signed in 1945. He broke in in 1946 with the Montreal Royals. And of course, in 1947, he makes his historic debut with the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Negro Leagues finally got the recognition they deserved beginning in the 1980s and 90s. What's kind of sad, though, if you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame today, which I did two years ago, the section on the Negro Leagues in black baseball has become, uh, for lack of a better word, decrepit. The lighting's not great there. It doesn't look as well kept as the rest of the museum. It looks kind of abandoned. If you've been recently, you noticed the new Latino section, which is fantastic. It's got new multimedia displays. It's got all kinds of cool colors. And it's kind of symbolic to me that the Negro League section of the museum has sort of been let go, if you understand what I'm saying. So this is just a list of my favorite Negro League players. When you see the players I put up here, this doesn't mean they're the best players. It means they're my favorite players. And it's my discussion, so I put, <laughs> so I put my players up here, OK? This is a picture of Willie Wells. Willie Wells is listed as the number one uh, Negro League shortstop of all time by many registers. John Henry Lloyd is the other great shortstop from the Negro Leagues. And Willie Wells was renowned for both his power and his speed. This is a picture of Satchel Paige. Satchel Paige might be the most famous black baseball player ever. Now, this is Satch's shirt that, that I have on today, Satch's number I have on today. He started playing ball when he was 17. He showed up at his first tryout with a satchel on his back with everything he owned, hence the name. And his first cleats were a pair of shoes that he had tamped roofing nails through when he showed up. Yes? By all accounts, he threw harder than anybody in the world at this time. And by that, I mean, we don't have a gun on people in this era. But most people would tell you Satch's fastball had more life than anything they had ever seen. He was long and lanky, 6'2", 175 on his heaviest days, and he could bring it. Eventually, he will make it to the major leagues, where he'll play five, six seasons. At age 41, he breaks in with Cleveland in 1948. All he did at age 41 was go 6-1 with a 2.48 ERA. Through three complete games, two shutouts, struck out 43 and had a 1.1 whip at 41. He kept throwing until he was 47, and he still had a lot of life in his arm at that point. Satchel Paige was known during these barnstorming tours to tell his outfield, guys, go sit down. Some innings he'd come out of the dugout by himself without an infield or an outfield, and everybody would wait, and he'd say, no, they're not coming out because nobody's going to hit the ball. Yeah, it was that level of theater that Satchel Paige had in his game that made him so beloved. This is Cool Papa Bell. I used to be fast, so anybody who's fast are my favorite players. I love speed. Cool Papa Bell was probably the fastest player in his era. Two sayings that I always tell you that, that I heard about Cool Papa Bell. He's the guy who was so fast he could turn the lights off and get into bed before it got dark. <laughs> And Cool Papa Bell could hit a ground ball up the middle, and it would hit him as he arrived at second. <laughs> that's an insane amount of speed, but that's how they used to talk about Cool Papa Bell's speed. Uh, James Thomas, his born name. And this lecture on paper was supposed to be about Norman Stearns, who I opened with. This is Norman Turkey Stearns. He gets his nickname, many said, because he was just awkward in how he ran, his stance at the plate, everything about him. He said it was because he had a pot belly until he was 13 and his family picked on him and called him a turkey. Either way, Turkey Stearns becomes one of the most storied hitters in Negro League history. Josh Gibson is the best power hitter in black baseball history. He's known as the Black Babe Ruth, but in black circles they call Babe Ruth the white Josh Gibson. And most people will argue Turkey Stearns hit the ball further than Josh Gibson. Turkey Stearns was a five-tool player. If you know anything about baseball, five tools. Hit for power, hit for average. You can run, you can throw, you can defend. You can beat people in five ways on any given day. The greatest players are five-tool players and they're the rarest of players. He was a true five-tool player. One of his uh, compatriots said of Turkey Stearns, he could beat you in so many ways, whether he was hitting home runs out of the three or four hole, batting leadoff and laying down bunts to start off innings, or running down line drives in the gap at the end of games. He had that kind of ability. He was that good. 
A great irony, he played in Detroit most of his life, and he didn't make enough money playing baseball to take care of his family. So in the summer, he worked at Detroit Auto Plants. The main one was owned by Walter Briggs. Walter Briggs was the owner of the Detroit Tigers at the time. So he actually worked for the man that owned the white baseball team in town, but during the summers at the auto plant, the greatest player in Detroit throughout that era. So Turkey Stearns uh, and Cool Papa Bell said that man could hit the ball as far as anybody, and I got to believe Cool Papa Bell. He gets into the Hall of Fame in 2000. Uh, he's a career 338 hitter and one of my favorite players ever. In 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education ended the apartheid era on paper. That did a lot of things for black sports, interestingly. Before Brown versus the Board of Education, historically black colleges and universities were some of the best programs in football, basketball, and baseball in the country. That changes once white schools integrate. The great Lou Brock went to Southern University, a historic black college and university. And what I didn't mention was during the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, some black folks are able to keep playing ba baseball through these historical black colleges and universities, yes? A handful of players. In 54, things start to change with the integration of Brown versus the Board of Education. Of course, John Carlos and Tommy Smith in Mexico City start to bring politics into sports, something that's become more and more of a discussion today. And what was clear is things were changing in baseball rapidly in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Go back for a minute. I'm going to bore you with some statistics just for a minute. So in 1951, Jackie Robinson led the league in war. War is wins against replacement. If you're a baseball geek, and actually my colleague, Dr. Cooper, is one of the original baseball geeks. He was doing fantasy baseball before it existed. So war is a new statistic that basically tells us how good a player really was. Jackie Robinson led the league in 1951 in war. By 1955, Willie Mays led the league in slugging percentage, total bases, Ernie Banks comes along in 58, leads the league in home runs, RBIs, stolen bases. And by the time you get into the mid-60s, what's clear in looking at the baseball reference dictionary, most of the records held each season are held by black players, black Americans and black Latinos combined. The Cubans have entered the league in 1965, the year Malcolm is killed. Willie Mays led the league in war. Roberto Clemente led the league in average. Slugging percentage, Willie Mays, a cat named Zolio Versalis, led the league in runs scored and doubles. A young Joe Morgan led the league in walks. Maury Wills led the league in stolen bases. And Billy Williams led the league in extra base hits. We even led the league in striking out that year. <laughs> Dick Allen struck out 150 times that year. Yeah, that's not the stats you want to have, but we even led the league in that as well that year. Jackie Robinson is renowned for breaking the color barrier, rightfully so. I didn't talk about Larry Doby. He does the same thing later that year in the American League. But black people broke a number of barriers within baseball. This is a picture of Glenn Burke. Glenn Burke was born in 1952 in November. Glenn Burke will be moved up to the LA Dodgers in 1978. Their team was called the Big Blue Machine. They played the Yankees that year in the World Series, and they lost. Glenn Burke was the spark that brought the Dodgers to the border of a world championship. Glenn Burke was the first openly gay player in Major League Baseball history. He said he knew by the time he was in the minor leagues that he was gay. He said to himself, every year, if I hit 300, it won't matter because they can't do anything about it. In his mind, he knew and he believed, if I keep producing, they can't get rid of me. So he did, and he played hard. When he was in L.A., he became friends with Tommy Lasorda, Jr. If you know anything about the Dodgers, you've heard of Tommy Lasorda. His son was gay and active in the gay community. He died at age 33. Tommy Lasorda, Jr.'s son did. In his obituary, his dad said he died of pneumonia and severe dehydration. He and Glenn Burke were close friends, and that upset Tommy Lasorda a great deal and the Dodgers organization. They traded him in 1978 for nothing to get rid of him. They traded him to the Oakland A's. 
And as soon as he got to Oakland, it was clear that his time in Major League Baseball was almost up. The manager at the time was Billy Martin, who you might have heard of, who coincidentally and interestingly died in a car crash in Appalachian not far from here. And Billy Martin was a homophobic, evil guy. Evil guy. No, he absolutely was. In 1979, in spring training, he goes around to everybody on the field and introduces them to each other. He reaches Glenn Burke and says, oh, by the way, this is Glenn Burke, and he's a faggot. That's reported widely in many periodicals, what happened to Glenn Burke. Glenn Burke's had a number of uh, specials recognizing his accomplishments since that time, but Glenn Burke has a claim to fame that no one can ever take from him. When Dusty Baker hit a home run in that pennant race in 78, Glenn Burke runs from the dugout, even though he's not playing. And at this time in, in the gay community, the high five is pretty regular. Yes? So he goes to dap up Dusty Baker, and Dusty Baker's like, <laughs> sort of confusingly, like, hits hands with him. That's the birth of the high five. Uh, and from that point forward, the high five has become synonymous with celebration throughout sports. It's one of Glenn Burke's greatest accomplishments, along with being brave enough to be out in an era where that was not accepted. It's a picture of Glenn on the, on the A's, and I just think his, his facial expression and his mood changes. I think he lost his will to play. Uh, Glenn Burke closed his eyes in 1995. He died of complications from AIDS himself. These are a list of some of my favorite players. So here's my selfishness again. When I started playing ball in the late 70s and 80s, I was enamored with professional baseball players, some more than others. This is UL Washington, a really average player. You know why I liked him? His fro looked cool in his hat. <laughs> and he played with a toothpick. If you look closely in the right corner of his mouth, he's got a toothpick in. It's not for the picture. He played the field with a toothpick. He would turn double plays with a toothpick, yes? <laughs> completely. You will never see something that hardcore. If you take the wrong tour to slide. I think I had a baseball card. I think his name was James Kirkwood, who had a toothpick in his picture. Now, I don't know if he played with it, but that was back in the early 60s. So I, was, I was fascinated whenever the Royals were on. Willie Wilson was one of my favorite players, a great speed player. But UL Washington's courage to play with a toothpick always was curious to me. That's Vince Coleman. 752 career stolen bases, one of the greatest speed guys of the 80s, ran like lightning. That's Tony Gwynn, died eventually of um, complications from jaw cancer, from chewing for so many years in the major leagues. Uh, Tony Gwynn's a career 338 hitter with a career 847 OPS. Didn't hit home runs, uh, swung the smallest bat, or used the smallest bat in the league for 10 years, and all he did was rake, rake, rake. That's Rod Carew. In my life, whenever I see somebody left-handed perform athletically and if they're gifted, it just looks prettier, <laughs> right? It just, it's just something about it. Whether it's a jump shot or a swing, there's just something more poetic and artistic about it. That's Rod Cruz's swing, and it is absolutely beautiful. It is, is a thing of art, truly. Rod Carew was a career 340 hitter, one of the greatest players of that generation. That's the Rick. Ricky Henderson was the cockiest player ever to play baseball, and rightfully so. He is the all-time leader in stolen bases at well, 1,406. He's also the all-time leaders in caught stealing at 335. He got caught stealing 42 times one year and stole 130 bases in the same year. That's crazy. If you don't steal, you don't, steal, you don't get caught. Um, when, when he breaks the stolen base record, he pulls the base out of the ground. He says, I'm the greatest of all time today. I mean, he's the, he's the Ali of baseball, unapologetically amazing. Uh, the career leader in leadoff home runs as well. And he used to do this thing in the outfield called cutting the pie. When Ricky Henderson would field a fly ball, and this thing could be a mile in the air, he would back up on it, sit down on it, and snatch it and smack his hip. So hard that if he timed it wrong, it would have knocked his teeth out. But he did it perfectly every time. We used to try to cut the pie, and it was the most dangerous thing ever. I wouldn't suggest you try it. It is so Ricky Henderson. The smoothest Leather man ever is Ozzie Smith. And everyone else I list, their, their hitting accomplishments. Ozzie Smith, in his lifetime, had 12,905 fielding opportunities. 12,905. He only made 280 errors. 
That's insane. His fielding percentage was 98%. You didn't hit the ball that way if you wanted to get on base because you were out. This is Ozzy turning a double play. And the poetry of him releasing the ball, getting into the air, and turning his hips is something that baseball players can see and understand how beautiful that is. I conclude. <laughs> Black people are disappearing from Major League Baseball. In 1975, 27% of the major leagues was black. It peaks in 1981 with roughly 30% of the league black. In 2014, only 8.5% of Major League Baseball is black. That's a picture of Andrew McCutcheon jumping over a catcher. I wouldn't suggest that either. He now plays for the, the San Francisco Giants. He was traded recently, but that's not why he's up there. There's a website called The Undefeated, and they do pretty hardcore sports articles, and they interviewed Andrew McCutcheon last year, and they asked him, where are all the black people going in baseball? And he gave this really detailed, interesting diatribe of his journey to the major leagues. Baseball has left black America for a number of reasons, one of which is cost. In order to play at the highest levels in baseball today, you have to play travel baseball, which means you have to be able to afford the fees connected with it, the hotel fees, the travel fees, etc. It has gone from a, a sort of a sandlot sport to a professionalized traveling sport that has frankly kept a lot of black people from being able to play. Division I scholarships, most programs only have 12, so they don't give full baseball scholarships. They give partial baseball scholarships. Compare that to football programs that have 85 scholarships to give out. There's just no collegiate financial incentive on the part of many black people across the country to specialize in baseball. There's another reality with baseball. Baseball is not a sport that you can get into later in life. Um, example, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was the greatest athlete on the planet when he got caught gambling <laughs> and told to go play baseball for a while so we don't investigate it any further. That's a different lecture. Uh, but he could not transition to baseball. It's too specific in its skill set and its regiment over time. Uh, to, to get to it late, you can't do. So if you're not playing young, your chances of playing at a high level aren't great. Marketing stinks. Baseball's not cool. The games are really long. Yes? There's nothing about it currently that Major League Baseball is doing to, to make it more attractive. There's some hope on the horizon. The Urban Youth Academy operates in Compton, Houston, the NOLA, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And 75% of UAA graduates have been drafted in the major leagues. Six have made it to the bigs. And 200 boys and girls that, compare, that compete in their programs have gotten Division I money. So you're having individuals who previously were executives in the major leagues, players in the major leagues, that are really trying to figure out what's going on in black baseball and try to bring the game back to black people and black people back to the game. Last year, 75% of the NBA was black, 64% of the NFL was black, and down to 7.5% of the major league baseball is black. We won the World Baseball Championship as a country last year. Last year, yes? Defeated the Dominican Republic really. in the final, <laughs> right? When you look at that roster, and I didn't give, I didn't give uh, photos, obviously. I just listed the roster. There's only two African-Americans on that list, Adam Jones and Andrew McCutcheon. And other than that, you have an array of, of different personalities like Giancarlo Stanton, uh, Nolan Arenado. But it's indicative of where black baseball is today. So the trajectory of blacks in America and black baseball in America is not that dissimilar, ultimately. It's sort of ebbed and flow as opportunity has ebbed and flowed for us, but it remains a constant challenge for us to remain relative in many segments in American society, and baseball is no different. Thank you. <laughs>